good. So today um, we will study about the law of God. And the subtitle is in letter and spirit, because the law of God is more than just the, the simple written rules, as we will see. And in the past, in the first study, we studied about um, the 1888 message and what it's all about. We, we saw that it is righteousness by faith. It is a Laodicean message. It's the heart of the three angels' messengers. It's what helps us to be ready for the second coming of Christ. Then the last time we studied also something very fundamental about the character of God, that everything his law says is only to our best. I thought we often might not see it, but we can know it by faith and by trusting his goodness. And we also study about the love of God, that God loves us very much. Um, he has proven that love. And that this should be like our motivation to follow him. Just because we, we also love him, and we don't want to hurt him through sin. And this is almost like a bit like an introduction. Like this was like the fundamentals. Now we really start with more really with the gospel topics. Um, and the first thing really to look at is the law of God. Because if there wouldn't be a law of God, there would be no need of a gospel. And yeah, having said this, let's, let's start. Um, And we want to start with something which is rather maybe a bit strange, but very important to, to see. Um, Alan White talks about in the great controversy in the chapter Modern Revivals about the law of God in relation to our own personal salvation. Um, she says here, the nature and the importance of the law of God have been to a great extent lost sight of. A wrong conception of the character, the perpetuity, that means like it's still lasting and still true and valid, and the obligation, that means like the need to keep it, of the divine law has led to errors in relation to conversion and sanctification. It has resulted in lowering the standard of piety in the church. Here, is to be found the secret of the lack of the spirits and power of God in the revivals of our time. Like also in, in, in the things I study, it's often like, uh, like you know, uh, with, with medicine, um, it's often that things, it's like a line of different causes like the one thing leads to another and this leads to again something else and this again leads to something else and she's describing here also like one of these logical chains and it's interesting she says a wrong conception of the character perpetuity and obligation of the divine law has led to errors in relation to conversion and sanctification that would be like the gospel conversion is starting the gospel experience and sanctification is continuing it. Um, and this again has resulted in lowering the standard of piety in the church. And in all of this is the secret or the, the cause why there's today's often a lack of the spirit and power in the revivals. So like this, this would be just the idea. Like the first thing is like a wrong conception of God's law. Like not really understanding what the law really demands of you, that it's still valid, and that it is actually necessary to do it. Um, because this can lead to false ideas about conversion and sanctification. Because, for example, if you think that the law is not valid anymore, or if you just think of the law as very like simple, easy things, or just very few things which the law requires you would probably be more likely be happy with like, or just satisfied with the gospel, which just maybe only forgives you. But you might not feel the need of a gospel, which has power to actually enable you to keep the law. And that's actually what's happened because the Christian world in general has lost sight of the, the breadth and immutability of the law of God they also have lost sight of what they actually should be. 
what God requires them to be. And because they didn't really saw this, they lost sight of a major part of the gospel, which is the only way to enable them to be like what the law requires. And this was shown that the standard of piety, of holiness, of a godly life in general has been lowered. So the people are less godly and less pious. And that's not good. So this definitely needs to be changed. But also with this logical chain, you can almost like find like the solution. Like you have to start with removing the cause. And to re reverse this, one must start with regaining a right conception of the character, perpetuity, or, and it should mean the obligation of God's law. So I believe probably all of us here, we still believe that the law of God is valid and that Christ didn't abolish it on the cross. So we don't have to focus so much on this. Probably, I thought we will do study this more next study. I hope we all also agree that the law needs to be kept. But what we might actually have to study more is actually the character or the like what the law really means. And then one that's what we want to do today. But here's just another quote from Ellen White where she is talking about this later in the same, same chapter she's saying. It is because the great principles of righteousness set forth in the law of God, or you could say oh, the principles of right doing, as set forth in the law of God, are so indifferently regarded by the Christian world that these fruits are so rarely witnessed, like of true piety and real conversion. This is why there has manifested so little of that deep, abiding work of the Spirit of God, which marked revivals in former years. It is by beholding that we become changed. And as those sacred precepts in which God has opened to man the perfection and holiness of his character are neglected and the minds of the people are attracted to human teachings and theories, what marvel that there has followed a decline of living piety in the church. Like if you don't sense that you're called to perfection and holiness, you will never try to reach that. It is only as the law of God is restored to its rightful position that there can be a revival of primitive faith and godliness among his professed people. And that's, I think, what we hopefully realize what we need. We, we need revival. We need reformation. And here we have like the instruction of how to do it. We have to first get the right conception of the law of God. And if we have that right, it will lead us to seek for the right gospel. And that, again, will increase the standard of piety in the church. And actually, if, if you might have read of our white checks, you said that the Laodicean message is just about to do that, to increase the standard of piety in the church. And why this is so, we can see here in Psalm 119, verse 96. Oh, sorry. We get to this in a moment. But why, you might ask now, but why do we have to study the law of God? Like, don't we know the law of God? Like, like, I know that we shouldn't have any other gods. We shouldn't worship any statues. We should keep the Sabbath. We shouldn't use God's name in vain. And then you can go on the list. The thing is, David here in Psalm 119 verse 96 says, I've seen the consummation of all perfection. But your commandment, it's exceedingly broad. Like the ideas, the Ten Commandments, what there's written is true. But there's actually more than what you can just see from the surface. Maybe you have seen like a picture of an iceberg. Like, you know, like often in psychology, like they use this, like on an iceberg, if you would like be on a ship traveling in the Arctic Sea, you would see a small part of the iceberg coming out of the water. But if you would actually dive underneath, you would see a whole much huger part under the water, which just from the surface you cannot see. And so the law of God, if you just read it outwardly, you might say, yeah, I'm doing all of this. But you might miss actually some of the deeper principles of the law. Like the outward thing, that's a letter. This deeper thing is the spirit of the law. We will talk about this more. And David here just is saying that the spirit of the law 
is exceedingly broad. Like the law is not just simply 10 things you shouldn't do. The law enters into every single phase of our life. Okay, having said this, let us look at the experience of the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, verses 7 to 9. And here again, I, I would invite, ask one of you to read that because this is actually helping us to understand what we are talking about. This is so important. A really bad noise. Romans 7 and 7 to 8. What shall we say then? Is this the law? Sin? God forbid. Nay, I have not, not known sin, but by the law. For I have not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not cover. He said, But sin taken occasion by the commandment, but in the all manner of uh, conception. For without the law, sin was dead. The stand, for I was blessed without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Thank you. Now, who of you knows what the Apostle Paul was before he became an apostle? Like, that's, that's actually a question. Like, if you want, you can answer. Paul, it, it's, it's fine if you, if you don't want to answer. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. And maybe you know what Pharisees do. Like, Pharisees are really studious. Like, they really spend a lot of time studying the Old Testament and especially also the law. So it's actually quite interesting that Paul, he says that he was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So actually, Paul, in a sense, he probably even memorized the law. He might even have memorized all the five books of Moses, like all these chapters. But he is actually describing his own experience, and he's saying that at one point, I thought he apparently knew it. He knew the letter of the law. The commandment again came to him, but now in spirit. He, he now deep understood what it really was more about than was just the outward rules. And he realized, actually, as it says here, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That doesn't mean that sin wasn't there before, but now when the commandment came, he actually saw how sinful his life is. And I thought he actually thought he would be fully righteous. He would be keeping everything the law said. But like apparently I thought he knew the law outwardly since uh, and not until this point, he really understood what the law really all meant. Um, and there the spirit brought it really home to his heart and revealed to him the things which from the, just the outward reading without the Holy Spirit helping is not really so apparent. But when this happened, he really realized how sinful he was. He realized that it says that sin revived and he died. Like he, he didn't die literally, but he realized that he was spiritually dead. And, um, and they had, he had no hope of, of escaping the condemnation of the law. The Almai talks about this in Steps to Christ. Paul says that as touching the righteousness which is in the law, as far as outward acts were concerned, he was blameless. Like, think about it. Like, Paul, like, he says this in Philippians 3, verse 6. Paul was saying, I'm sinless. I'm blameless. I've kept the law. But when the spiritual character of the law was discerned, he himself, he saw himself a sinner. Judged by the letter of the law as man applied to the outward life, he had abstained from sin. But when he looked into the depth of its holy precepts and saw himself as God saw him, he bowed in humiliation and confessed his guilt. 
he says, I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When he saw the spiritual nature of the law, sin appeared in its true hideousness and his self-esteem was gone. Like Paul might have thought, I'm paying my tithe. I'm going to church on Sabbath. I'm reading my Bible. I'm bringing the sacrifices. I'm fasting. I'm, I'm applying the dress reform. And I'm doing all these things. But actually, he was actually hating people and persecuting the followers of Christ at the same time. And then when, when the spirit came, he actually realized that I thought his outward life was like righteous, like his heart was unclean. And he realized that those just as like roots going into everything he did. Here's another quote about the same thing. We may flatter ourselves, as did Nicodemus, who was also a Pharisee, that our life has been upright and that our moral character is correct, and think that we need not humble the heart before God like the common sinner. But when the light from Christ shines into our soul, we shall see how impure we are. We shall discern the selfishness of motive, the enmity against God, that defiled every act of life. Then shall we know that our righteousness is indeed as filthy rags, like like rags with like actually in the Hebrew it talks about like rags with blood on it, and that the blood of Christ alone can cleanse us from the defilement of sin and renew our hearts in His own likeness. And today, what we really want to do, we want to make sure that we not only know the law and let them, but that we actually have the spirit bring home to us the spirit of the law. And that we, if we not have had it, might realize a bit more about ourselves if that's need, necessary. And it might not be for everyone, but if it's necessary, I pray that God will open and soften our hearts for this. It says a bit further, one, like, because if you can read the Bible, without the spirit really talking to you so much. And then you can just have this outward righteousness. The only way to get the deeper thing is through the spirit. And then Elva talks a bit here about it. One ray of the glory of God, one gleam of the purity of Christ, penetrating the soul, makes every spot of defilement painfully distinct and lays bare the deformity and defects of the human character and makes apparent the unhallowed desires, the infidelity of the heart, the impurity of the lips. The sinner's act of disloyalty in making void the law of God are exposed to his sight, and his spirit is stricken and afflicted under the searching influence of the Spirit of God. Like the Holy Spirit then will search our hearts and reveal all the things in our life where we are fallen short, and where we actually are opposed to the principles of God's law. He loathes himself as he views the pure, spotless character of Christ. And this is the only step. This is the actually very first step in salvation. If we don't really have a deeper sense of how sinful we are outside of Christ, we will never seek for like a deeper experience of, of the righteousness of Christ. And can it be that Seventh-day Adventists not all, but in a large measure, have not seen the depth of the holy, just, and perfect law of God yet. Now, that's a question. And therefore, need the eye solve of the law and the word of God to enlighten us to the breadth of the law of God and also with the law about ourselves. Like, there's an evidence in Revelation that we actually need in the Laodicean message. It says, I'm rich, I've, and then talking about how, how our attitude, attitude is, at least in general, how Jesus sees it. I'm rich, I've become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you, anoint your eyes with eyesalve that you might see. And have you ever wondered what the eyesalve is? Part of it we find here in Psalm 19, verse 8. 
the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Can you see that like the commandment of God like enlightens our spiritual eyes so it helps us to restore sight? It also says that the law of God is like a lamp on our feet. Like in the darkness, it helps us to see. It, it helps to cure the blindness. So actually part of the Laodicean message is that we need to have a deeper eyesight about ourselves. And this is done through the law of God and this Holy Spirit. Because this is the first step. If you're blind so that you're wretched, you will never seek a doctor. Or you never seek for the remedies. Only if you realize and your blindness is removed moved through eyesight, you can see that you're wretched, miserable, poor, and naked. And then seek the white raiment, the gold tried in the fire, and the, which is the solution for letting, letting Christ into the heart. And having said this, like this is like the introduction. So now we want to really study the Ten Commandments and see actually what it really means to keep them. Because maybe like some people are a bit like the Apostle Paul as a Pharisee. They think they're doing everything the law commands, while they actually are blind to the deeper requirements of the law. And the first thing to notice is that the law is not just dealing with actions. You can transgress the law in thought, in motive, or even in words. Like without doing something outwardly, just things in your mind can make you fall short. It says in James, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now it says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So he's going through some points, but he then makes a summary, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, which implies that the law also deals with our words, which we speak. And, and it continues a little bit later in James talking just now about the words, for we, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in words, He's a perfect man. It also says that the, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So your words are an indication of your heart. Able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and return the whole body. Look, all said ships, although they are so large and are driven by first winds, they are turned by a very small ruder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Now let's read Ephesians 5, 3 and 4 together. And yeah, maybe can one of you read that? Ephesians 5, 3 and 4. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become sins. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Thank you. I, I think it's probably also very clear. These verses also show that also, our words should be pure um, because impure words are an indication that the heart is impure. If the heart would be pure, there are only pure words. But if they're impure words or unfriendly words are just not good words, that's an indication that the heart is not good. Even if we only speak about something bad but don't do it, 
it is still a transgression of the law. And now regarding thoughts, in Isaiah 55, verse 7, it says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. It's like two people, the, the wicked his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So only your thoughts can make you unrighteous of their unrighteous thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. Well, like if you think about the story in the Bible with a woman who... Like there were many people giving a lot of money, but there was this woman just paid like something almost like two pennies. But Jesus actually recommended a woman paying so much less than the other rich people, much more than the rich people. <clears throat> and it, it's clear that, that God, because a woman, her motive to do it was right. While the rich people wanted to be like seen by men or it was not such a big self-denial for them to do it. And this shows that actually God is like also evaluating us based on the motive behind the actions, what we do. For example, if I would preach a sermon to just glorify myself and people think that I'm a great preacher, that is just a hypothetical just an example. If I would do it for that reason, it might even be a good sermon, but it's of no value with God because it's just interwoven with selfishness. Or with this example, if somebody would give even money or even time for some good work, but he's doing that from like a wrong or selfish purpose and not from wishing the best for the other person, he's guilty. I thought outwardly he's even acting right. So, so we can see that the law is not just simply actions. It's also actions, but it begins in the motive, thoughts, and words. And you can think of it, if your motive and thoughts are right, that will lead to right words, and right words and also thoughts will lead to actions. So God is actually just simply very, very through if he forbids the very origin of evil, which is in our thoughts and motives and even emotions. Because if we check like the evil at the very root, it will never come up to actions. I thought if you allow it in your mind and might outwardly don't do it, if you just long enough do it in your mind, eventually you do it outwardly and in your heart you're already doing it. So um, you're just as guilty, just the opportunity has not come to do it, but in your heart you would have done it if the opportunity is there. So God counts thoughts and motive the same evil as actually doing it. But now let's start with the first commandment. So today we might go to commandment six and do the rest tomorrow. You shall have no other gods before me. So this outwardly like seems good. Like we, we shouldn't like go to another church or next to Jehovah. Also worship maybe Krishna. We should only worship God alone. But actually, there's this, this is just, this, that's true. That's very true. And for many people, that's important to know. But some of the other things involved with that is, for example, it says in Mark, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, uh, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first command. So even if you would... Give something else more. Um, if you wouldn't give God in your heart, soul, mind, and strength the first place, and the best place, and the last place, and just whatever he wants of that, he can have it. That's not the case. You're actually allowing something else to be to you more God than God. And that would already be transgressing this command. Jesus says here, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Because then there would be more of the heart to father and mother than for Christ. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So he's just saying, even people you really like, if they're more important to you than God, that is wrong. And he who does not take his cross and follow him after me is not worthy of me. Because then we would be liking ourselves more than God. He who finds his life will lose it. 
and he will lose his life for my sake or find it. For whatever we would give more attention to as God, we would make him or that object a God. And therefore we would have another God than God. And now here's one, another verse from Deuteronomy. And this is really a really strong verse. Now today it's not so applying. Maybe we read it first. But think about this. Maybe think if, if you read this verse, read yourself in the verse. If your brother, like if you have a brother, the son of your mother, your son or your daughter, the wife of your bosom, or your friend who is as your own soul, like that's mean like your very best friend, secretly enters you saying, let us go and serve other gods. Or like sin, do something wrong. Which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you, or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. You shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall you, I pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death and afterwards the hand of all the people. So it doesn't mean that we, in Israel, God was just in commanding this. But I don't think that we are like, literally should kill people today if they want to enter us to go against God. So don't misunderstand that. But like the principle is still true. Like even if like your brother or your sister, like you're very close to you, you only really like and you have a close bond to them. Or like your parents, or maybe your wife or your sons or daughters or even like your best friend, if they would enter you away from God, you should be like so firmly loving God more that you would really by no means enter into that. And you actually would be sad and like even hating to do wrong. Because otherwise you would make another God. So this is how, how God, the command, really asks us how serious we have to be with God. Now let's turn to 1 John 2 verse 15, which is another thing pointing or talking about this. What else can become a God? And again, if one of you wants to read that verse, please read it. The world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Thank you. So, not only people or things like this, it says that even if we love the world, the love of God is not in us. Now, how can we love the world? Like, do you maybe have some, some suggestions? What would it be like love of the world? How would it manifest itself? For example, maybe it would be if you love education more than God, or having a good, um, like getting a job where God doesn't call you to be in, but where you might get much more money than working for God. Um, or like, praise of other people or honor or like a good reputation there are many things people in the which the world gives which people can love more than god and therefore leave god or just love themselves and seek these things so even that would be like giving to these things an undue place and make them higher in on our affections than god and that would make them a god and be a transgression. Albert summarizes now this, and we didn't look at all, but GC gives a very good summary in Patriarchs and Prophets about what the first command means, actually. Jehovah, the eternal self-existent, uncreated one, himself the source and sustainer of all, is alone entitled to supreme reverence and worship. 
man is forbidden to give any other object the first place in his affection or his service. Whatever we cherish that tends to lessen our love for God or to interfere with the service due to him, of that do we make a God. So not only our love for him, but also lessens or interferes with the service due to him. And I invite you really to reflect upon this and to ask God, Lord, if, if I have to learn more about your law and about myself, please teach me that. And I invite you to pray that to God. And maybe later go maybe again over these things and actually really carefully reflect upon yourself. Now let's go to the second command. It says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, for showing mercy to those who love me and keep my commandments. We really today just want to focus on the first part about the carved images, like the later part needs to be rightly understood, like whom like was showing mercy and those things and visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. It doesn't mean that God punishes children for things the parents that did wrong. That's, that's not what it meant. But that's not for now. But like, apparently God is very strict that we shouldn't serve and worship any image by any statue, anything like this um, in our worship of him. He says we shouldn't make a carp image or any likeness of anything. But what are other things which are actually idolatry? And there's an in verse where we, which we can read in Colossians 3, um, verse 5. And yeah, if one of you wants to read, otherwise I can also read it. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Thank you. So can you see what else is idolatry? Like you don't have to have like a statue of Paul in your living room to practice idolatry. Like Money can be idolatry. Or like possessions. Or maybe if you don't have so much, maybe your clothing, your phone, or something like that can be idolatry. If you like have an object which you serve. Statues are still an issue in many heathen parts of the world or in Catholicism or other religions that give great attention to certain objects. But as we already looked, it can also be like practical things without really having like a statue of a god. I might just commenting on this. The second command forbids the worship of the true god by images or similitudes. Many heathen nations claim that their image were mere figures or symbols by which the deity was worshipped. So. That's actually important to notice because sometimes people say like, like we're not really worshiping like the statue. We are worshiping Jesus, not the statue. But it's as like also the heathen said that, that this was not like the real statue they worship. They were just worshiping Baal through the statue. But the command forbids any worship like this involving statues. The attempt to represent uh, the attempt to represent the eternal one by material objects would lower man's conception of God. The mind turned away from the infinite perfection of Jehovah would be attracted to the creature rather than to the creator. And his conceptions of God were lowered so would man become degraded. So this is a, again status, but it also can deal with other objects which we can serve more than God. Now to the third command. And here again, we can also look a bit deeper. 
It says, you shall not make the name, uh, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. That's also very strong. It's just, and God will not take it lightly if we take his name in vain. But like, how do we take God's name in vain? Like the name of God, like it's in the New King James and the King James is like often written law, like every letter written capital. And it actually is Jehovah or Yahweh. We normally don't use that name very often. But like this word for vain would also mean to use it in a careless way in a light way like for example if you make a joke including god that would be using god's name in vain or in a light manner or like you know like in germany people have like this this phrases they say like if something bad happens they say oh my then they also talk about god and i think that's also taking god's name in vain because they're not really praying to god saying oh God, please help us. It's terrible what has happened. They're just saying this in vain, like for no real re reason. It's just like they, they, they don't really think about God, just like outwardly. But there's more. Like that would be, for example, some examples to use the name of Godless in a light or careless manner or in, in a conversation or in a joke or something like this. In Second Timothy, it says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stand, having the seal. The Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Because the thing is, when you name the name of Christ, that normally also means that you're actually a Christian, and you're representing him. And you would take the name of God in vain, or you would misrepresent God's name, by actually yourself not being a real Christian, by being, as it says here, in iniquity. So Paul says that everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Because if there would be in iniquity, that would make them using God's name to be it in vain or defiling the name of God. It says also, yeah, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And in Romans, this idea that actually we, by our life, can misrepresent God and God's name um, is even stressed in a very clear way about the Jews. And yeah, I would again ask one of you, please read verses 17 to 24 in Romans chapter 2. And while reading that, you might implant the word for Jew Adventist, like reading that, because it will talk about Jew. If, if you listen to the person reading, you can just find in your mind, maybe implant Adventist. Because as the Jews were the people of God back then, we are so today. But yes, please go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like we can't hear you. Otherwise, I can also read this. Indeed, you are called a Jew. Or you could say, indeed, you're called the Seventh-day Adventist and rest on the law and make your vows in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent and being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. So it says like, it's somebody like who knows his Bible. Um, 
and even like outwardly says, yes, that's a good thing to do. That's the wrong thing to do. He approves the things that are excellent. And he even thinks himself capable of teaching it to others. But then it says, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your vows in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? Like in, in the German translation, actually, it's like Paul's not just making the question, he's actually making the point. You tell others don't do it, but you're doing it yourself. So just telling others and like uplifting a good moral standard, that's right as far it goes. But if you don't practice it, it's yourself. Then it says in verse 24, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. So can you see that if we call ourselves Christians, but don't live as Christians should live, we are actually doing evil to God's name. Because when other people then look at us, they say, oh, that's a Christian. Like, if that's a Christian, like, I don't want to be a Christian because, like, that's not a nice person. And by this, we might become guilty of blaspheming the name of God if we, if we not really live like Christ. Now I comments on this and gives also some explanation. This command not only, so it does, but not only forbids false oaths, like making like an oath. It doesn't forbid like if you're in court and have to give an oath. So don't worry about this, but we shouldn't take any oaths. And generally, and common swearing, like using like bad words. But it forbids us to use the name of God in a light or careless manner without regard to its awful significance. By the thoughtless mention of God in common conversation, like it doesn't mean that you cannot witness for God using his name, but if you just use his name like without really thinking about it, like, yeah by appeals to him in trivial matters and by the frequent and thoughtless repetition of his name. We dishonor him. Like for example, in prayer, if you, I heard that, that you can pray like, and you say like, God, you pray something, and you use his name very often or say very often, Lord. Like that would, and you're not really saying it because like, you're really appealing to God or just like using it just almost like to fill like the gap between sentences. That would be like thoughtless repetition of his name. And it says all should uh, holy and reverend as his name. All should mediate upon his majesty, his purity and holiness that their heart may be impressed with a sense of its exalted character. And his holy name should be uttered with reverence and solemnity. Because otherwise we take the name in vain and God will not hold guiltless who does that. Because if we use God's name in vain, we lower man's conception of God and we ourselves show that we don't really see the, the exaltedness of God as creator and God and not as a creature as we. Now let's come to the fourth commandment about the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So yet the center of the Ten Commandments is now to remember the Sabbath day, which was established in creation. It says six days in the week we should work. But the seventh day is a day for no work, no secular work and no private work. That's like the outward thing the Sabbath calls for. There's, there's much you can do a whole sermon on how to keep the Sabbath. For many, 
just actually realizing that it's Saturday and not Sunday and that the Sabbath is still valid, this might be really important. Like many people have lost sight of even just the letter of this commandment. But there's also something about the spirit of this commandment about resting the seventh day. It's not just the rest in actions. It's actually a rest also in word and thoughts from secular things and focusing on God. It says in Isaiah 58 verse 13, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day. So you might not be working, but you might be doing your own pleasure on the Sabbath. Like that can be from very little things to very big things. It doesn't mean that you... You cannot be happy on the Sabbath, actually the very opposite. But your happiness and pleasure should be in the Lord and his ways, not in your own ways. Because it says, in, and call the Sabbath a delight, a holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Like that means that on the Sabbath, it's not like to seek our own pleasures, like you go to church in the morning and then late in the afternoon, maybe meet with friends for just some pleasure. I mean, like you can meet with friends to study the Bible or go for a nature walk or things like these. Like that, that's, that does not seeking our own pleasure. But like maybe going on like a big hiking trip just as an adventure and not really so much about beholding nature or if you meet to by games or something like this, which are not spiritual or something like this, that would be like a transgression of this. Also, we have to be holy to keep the Sabbath holy. But if you think about it, you cannot take something clean, like if you have washed some white clothes, if you know, was outside doing some garden work and your hands are really dirty, if you come and I want to keep like the white shirts clean with the dirty hands, that's impossible. So to really keep the Sabbath holy, we first have to be holy, like we first have to be clean. So also just, if you're not, you might be keeping Saturday, but you're not keeping Sabbath. And Alan White is commenting on this. God has given man six days when to labor and he requires that their own work be done in the six working days. Actually, just for a moment, I, I will have to. Sorry, but yeah, I'm back. It's not my comments about the spiritual parts of the Sabbath. God has given man six days when to labor and he requires that the own work be done in the six working days like that's like the outward labor she also says acts of necessity and mercy are permitted on the side the sick and suffering are at all times to be cared for like for example in like a hospital like the very sick people for example but unnecessary labor is to be strictly avoided and so also we like we should ask ourselves on the sabbath like is this really necessary to do it now or can I not do it later? And if it's unnecessary, if there's no like need to do it, then we shouldn't do it. But here about more like about talking our own words, those who discuss business matters or lay plans on the Sabbath, like about plans I want to do after the Sabbath. Like if you're like before sundown, you're sitting and already talking what you'll do after the Sabbath, like that would be that are regarded by God as not engaged in the actual transaction of business. To keep the Sabbath holy, we should not even allow our minds to dwell upon things of a worldly character. Like, think about this. Like, we should not even allow our minds to dwell upon things of a worldly character. And the command includes all within our gates. The inmates of the house are to be are to lay aside their worldly business during the sacred hours. All should unite to honor God by willing service upon his holy day. And it also means that Sabbath is not just for like lazy rest. Like we, we can rest. Like the Sabbath is also intended for rest. Or like if we just like 
sleeping the whole Sabbath or the whole afternoon every Sabbath, that's also not God's plan. Like it says, it's also a day for willing service, like to, to do evangelism or something in church on the afternoon. Like it, it doesn't say that every Sabbath you have to do that and that maybe not the Sabbath you can take off and be in nature or rest or something like this. That's not what it means. But like in general, the Sabbath is also a day for service next to rest. Now let's do the fifth commandment and then we leave it with that for today. It says, you honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. If you think about this, what it really means to honor father and mother, like it can actually mean very much. For example, in Isaiah, it talks about it, Isaiah 58, about the fast, which we are called to do. Is it not you share to, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked that you cover him. But now about parents. And do not hide yourself from your own flesh. Like the, the commandment really requires like love for parents. That we don't hide ourselves from them. But we actually, um, yeah, we actually care for them. Like our own flesh means like our own family. Um, like when the parents are of old age or even before that to not have them do all the things in the household themselves um, to lighten their chaos and things like these and to help them support them also encouraging them and yeah doing that from like a heart loving the parents not just as outward compliance in Romans 1 verse 29 and 30 it says being filled with all unrighteousness and disobedience to parents. Like Paul talks about like a list of things. It also says to honor the parents means to be obedient to the parents. Also, let us look at Malachi chapter four, verses five and six, about what the Bible says about how the relationship of parents and children should be like. And if one of you wants to read, Please do. Number five, four, and five, six. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he has turned the heart of the fathers to the children. And the heart of the children to their, to their fathers, that I come and smite the earth with a sword. Thank you. So it actually says before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, God will send an Elijah. So that was in the first way was John the Baptist, but also before the second coming, that will be on Elijah. And actually, we see it actually especially applying to us. And this Elijah, uh, preaching the gospel should really turn the hearts of parents and children towards each other. And that's actually showing that God's ideal would be that parents and children are united. That's like no animosity or bitterness between parents and children. Like it doesn't say that everything parents ever do is like right. They, they also can make mistakes. The parents should have like, children had like, should have like a heart of forbearance and still patience and love for their children, for their parents. And the parents also should really be interested in their children and love them and not neglect them. And really that their hearts are united, as you can see in the picture. It's not like living together in a house, but like really being united in heart also. But it's important, this is only possible if both parents and children have their hearts changed through the gospel from their cold hearts to a Christ-like heart. And it's important, like maybe for you, if you now want to do that, um, like we are called to do as much as we can do to have peace with others. But if the others don't respond, it, 
we cannot change that. But we, we are called to do as much. So maybe your parents will not answer that. But you're still called to do as much as possible from your side to do. But actually, if you think about parents, like the idea is that parents are like really set by God with authority to care for their children. And the same principle would, for example, apply if you have a pastor or somebody at state, like a ruler or statesman, or maybe even if you have like a boss somewhere at work. Um, like it's, it's it, like the general principle is that if God has implanted an authority, we should regard this authority and be obedient to that authority. That's like the thought. Um, most it's like parents, but I can also talk about other authorities. And here's some examples what the Bible talks about it. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. In sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as man pleases, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Like that's about like maybe at work. Um, in Romans, it talks about governments, that every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Therefore, you must, um, so it means not only should we be like obedient to governments, not only to, um, um, for the sake of avoiding a punishment, but also for our conscience towards God. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continue to, continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to taxes are due, customs to my customs, and fear to fear and honor to honor. So, for example, mean that we shouldn't be like speeding, for example, or like if we if we do something else with the government, we should do it right, uh, and we should follow the rules. Um, there's one thing we have to notice also about them. Um, in Hebrews 13, verse 17, we, we don't have to read it now, but you can read it if you want later. It also talks about like people in church, like pastors, by elders or so. But there's also one thing to notice. Because obedience due to these authorities is only due to them in the authority given them of God. Like that means it doesn't apply when governments, parents or pastors or somebody else requires things that are against God's law. Then we don't have to obey them. But if they don't, but if they um, require things which we might don't even want to do, but which are not violating God's law, we should do it. But if they, for example, call us to um, don't go to church on Sunday, uh, don't go to church on, on Sabbath, but go to church on Sunday, we don't have to be obedient. If our parents want us to do things which God doesn't want, then we don't have to obey. Or if the pastor says something which is wrong, we, we are not called then to obey them. But otherwise we should, even if it's against our natural wishes. The Bible in the Bible is expressed in Acts 5 verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. But this doesn't mean that if man don't require obedience where they shouldn't, that we shouldn't obey them in the things where they justly require obedience. And now White also talks about this. And with this, we will close for today. Parents are entitled to a degree of love and respect which is due to no other person. God himself, who has placed upon them responsibility for the souls committed to their charge, has ordained that during the early years of life, parents should stand in the place of God to their children. And he who rejects the rightful authority of his parents is rejecting the authority of God. 
The fifth command requires children not only to yield respect, submission, and obedience to their parents, but also to give them love and tenderness, to lighten their cares, to guard their reputation, and to succor and comfort them in old age. It also enjoins respect for ministers and rulers and for all others whom God has delegated authority. So for example, helping parents when they're old or when they need help with something or when they're older or for example, also to guard their reputation, even if they've done something wrong, like not to spread that abroad or something like this. Like it doesn't say that if parents commit a crime that this cannot be brought to the police. Um, but I think you know what it says. Like if parents have done something wrong or maybe or maybe they even done something right, but you don't like it, you shouldn't be talking with your friends about like your parents in a bad way. You should guard their reputation or something and this. So today we already look at the first five commandments and tomorrow we'll continue. But for now, I just want to invite you that you um, yeah, reflect in prayer upon what we studied, really about the deeper principles of the law, um, that we might realize that we need some power from outside to help us keep the law. So with that, I, I ask you really to take time later today, um, maybe after we pray, to pray again and reflect what we studied. But now let's us pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we had this time of studying. Heavenly Father, thank you that your law was given for good. And if the law would have been kept, this world would be a different place. Thank you also that the law actually reveals to us sin, that we might seek a solution and we might change. Lord, please impress us where we have fallen short of your law and lead us, God, to seek and to choose a different way, the, the way of obedience to the law. And Lord, make us willing to surrender everything what the law might show us what was wrong. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.